Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and today I decided to take a quick look at Nathan Oakley's channel because people have been telling me that his channel isn't doing so well. Now Nathan Oakley and I, we are very good friends, so I had to go over to his channel to check it out for myself to see if the rumours were true. And when I got there, there was something that stuck out to me quite a bit. And that was that Nathan Oakley clearly hasn't forgotten our friendship because he had a thumbnail which had me in it. But not only did he put me in the thumbnail, but my face is taking up a quarter, possibly even a third of the thumbnail. Very interesting to say the least, but it's clearly because of our deep friendship. I also noticed that he put AB Science in the thumbnail, and I didn't realise that Nathan Oakley and AB Science were such good friends, so that is also good to know. But the question is, what is the contents of that video? Because the video is titled Flat Earth Debate 1602, and I am in the thumbnail, so you'd assume that there is a debate taking place, and that debate would be between me and Nathan Oakley. However, I don't recall debating Nathan Oakley, if you can even call what Nathan Oakley does a debate, any time recently, so that's obviously not the reason why I'm in the thumbnail. So clearly what happened is during the debate that Nathan Oakley had during that stream, I was bored up and so Nathan Oakley decided to put me in the thumbnail. So let's take a look at that debate, shall we? I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel... Yeah, we get it Nathan. So I'm actually just going to fast forward to the point that the debate starts. Unfortunately if you are watching this live, this is where we bid you farewell. That's odd, there's no debate in that debate. It's almost like people have caught on to what Nathan Oakley's debates actually are, and it's a way to see if Nathan Oakley can make his audience go deaf simply by yelling into his microphone. Nathan Oakley has clearly invested a lot into hearing aid companies, and that is why he does what he does. Well, seeing as the debate wasn't a debate, let's see what that debate was actually about then. I think we've covered um, all the housekeeping questions, have we not? I know Brian's keen to present something. Did we cover everything? Molten iron core. Any evidence of a self-perpetuating molten iron core at the centre of said presupposed spherical earth? There was so little evidence for that, it is comical. It uh, is a before, pure myth, it is. So I've figured out the topic of the debate, and for people that don't like the earth being round, they sure do like circle jerking, don't they? So I understand why people say that Nathan Oakley's channel isn't doing so well, and Nathan Oakley, as your friend, possibly even your best friend, I want to give you a bit of advice to help you out. Delete your- But in all seriousness, the reason why your channel isn't doing too well is because of the topic that you keep on choosing. You keep on choosing the topic of circle jerking, and I don't think your audience finds that topic to be all that entertaining. Now if you actually found someone to debate, then you'd probably be able to do a bit better, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people that are willing to debate Nathan Oakley. Now Nathan Oakley will say that it's because they're all scared of Nathan Oakley. But the thing is, I know quite a few people that are willing to debate Nathan Oakley, but only if it is on a neutral platform. So I guess what I'm saying is, Nathan Oakley, if you want your channel to do well, stop being a little bitch. Even I'd be willing to debate Nathan on a neutral platform such as Modern Day Debate or the SC Toon Show, but I know that he's not going to accept it because he doesn't have his mute button on those. Now, I'd say prove me wrong, Nathan, but I know that you're not going to prove me wrong. But anyway, back to the debate that isn't a debate. Brian's logic decided that he wanted to present something, so... What is it that you're going to present, Brian? An observer standing here, looking directly up at the zenith, can take uh, an angle measurement. I'm just going to get uh, another one here, just one second. Can take an angle measurement to anything up from here, right along, and right down, and take down. Now, they can't take an angle. They can't make an elevation angle. But they can, take, they can put an angle line right, to something in the sky. I see that Flat Earthers are still struggling with the ability to realise that a horizontal plane doesn't mean a physical plane. Right down to where this red arrow is. That is the extent of it, right? They can't go any further than this red arrow because they can't bring, if they try to bring this red arrow any further, not only would the curve of the Earth, of the globe are getting their way, but then if it, when they bring that down, it is not a 90 anymore. 
So it goes past what is their zero point, right? I see that they are also struggling with the ability to realize what a negative number is. You can have negative numbers. I use negative numbers for angles and programming all the time. So if you do end up measuring an angle that's lower than the zero point, then you simply measure a negative number. You don't actually change the zero point. Now we did say that on a globe Earth, if you were to try and measure anything below that zero point, then the curve of the Earth would get in the way. However, the thing is, we've been trying to tell you this for years, but the horizon does not rise to eye level. So this means that there is a tiny amount between eye level and the horizon that you could actually measure something that is below zero without the curve of the Earth getting in the way. But the problem is, this is where the star would be at zero. Now, it doesn't matter how far away you move the star, right? That's where the star is for them, for their zero. So anything that goes past that is no good. But this here, this red circle, that is the GP of the star, right? And this is an angle from the center out to the star. So an angle from the 90 down to zero, that is 5,400 right, minutes of degree. Now that's supposed to become 5,400 nautical miles on the surface of the Earth. It's this full section here that, has to, that is the 5,400 nautical miles. The star that's at this point will never ever be here. They need the star to be here, regardless of how far away it is, it needs to be there, right? And if you bring it as far as you want away, eventually you're gonna have to do this. That's what happens, you're going past the night, you're going past the zero. So there is a problem with Brian's logic here, and that is the fact that stars are very far away. They're not just, you know, a couple of hundred kilometers away from the Earth. No, they are light years away from the Earth. So if you get an angle of 90 degrees at the equator to a star, then the same star measured at either of the poles would practically be zero degrees. Also, let's not forget the whole size of a star. Brian's acting like a star is smaller than Earth. No, stars are huge. They are large. They are far bigger than the size of Earth. But anyway, I'm going to fast forward to the point where I get mentioned so that I can find out why I'm in the thumbnail. According to the diagram, yeah, what they're claiming, that's a geometric. It's formed by yeah. the geometry. It's got nothing to do with distance and the eye per se. It's formed by the relationship between the height of the observer and the size of the ball you're looking over. So it's a geometric horizon? Oh, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Oh, right. We are not going to see the geometric horizon, end quote, planner walk. New quote, the rumpus. The geometric horizon only exists in the maths, end quote. New quote, AB science. We are not expecting to see the geometric horizon. So I'd like to know why in unholy hell this is labelled as visual horizon when it's something that we do not and cannot and wouldn't expect to see. You know, the reason why it's labelled as visual horizon is it's because it's the horizon that we see, not the geometric horizon. If it was the geometric horizon, then it would be labeled as geometric horizon. Yeah, you cannot use a visual instrument to measure the geometric horizon. But this is, but according to this, it's being measured as the geometric horizon to do this math solving. So the thing that they're talking about here is of course the sextant. You know, the thing that flat earthers can't stop talking about, despite them having zero understanding of it. Now, one of the things that a lot of sextants use is they use the horizon to obtain measurements. Now, of course, when you're using the horizon, you have to do dip correction. Now, the problem that Nathan and co are having is that the horizon can be refracted, meaning that any measurements that you take using the horizon can have a bit of error in them. Now, I'm not sure if Nathan thinks that because the horizon can be refracted, that means that a sextant can't work on a globe because, spoiler alert, whether the Earth is flat or a globe, the horizon can still be refracted. Now, I'm not sure if Nathan is aware of this, but I checked the tables for dip correction and they assume 7 over 6 are refraction. 
So yes, the horizon that you apply dip correction to is not the geometric horizon, because if it were the geometric horizon, then you wouldn't use 7 over 6R refraction. You'd just go, okay, not going to account for refraction here. But yeah, but fundamentally, once you dip as a baller, you're defeated. Because in doing so, there is that fundamental statement that your dip horizon is a correction to a leading edge, a geometric physical edge. All right, so here we have a correction table for dip. And it's not the only correction table that I've decided to bring. We've got this correction table for dip, just in case you don't trust the first one. And I've also written a program to calculate the dip of the horizon. So with this program, what it does is you input a height in meters, and then it will give you a geometric dip to the horizon and a refracted dip to the horizon. Keep in mind that these values are in arc minutes. So if these dip tables do not account for refraction at all, and just use the geometric horizon, then we should see the geometric dip line up with the dip tables. However, if they account for 7 over 6R refraction, then it will be the refracted dip that will line up with these tables. Alright, so let's run it and see what we get. Let's start with a height of, uh, I don't know, 6 meters. Alright, All right, so we get a geometric dip of 4.7 arc minutes and a refracted dip of 4.4 arc minutes. Let's see what this says. So we go down to here, and we get 4.3. Maybe there's a bit of an error with the rounding, that could be a thing. And what happens if we go over to here, and go to 6, well there's 4.3 and 4.4. So obviously there's slight error with my maths, but pretty close. What about, I don't know, not 120, 10 meters. Alright, so we get a geometric dip of 6.1. Um, and okay here we go 10 meters so 5.6 all right and what did my program say for that five oh 5.6 bang on it's not the 6.1 there what about this table we go down to i clicked on something that i didn't mean to click on <laughs> all right 10.3 yeah, we've got 5.6 right there. So obviously, refraction is being accounted for there because the refraction results were closer than the geometric results. And they are using something that was at least close to 7 over 6R for refraction. Although, the problems that I got with the 6 meter one could be due to rounding, or it could be due to my maths being somewhat out of whack. Either way, it was only 0.1 of an arc minute off, and it certainly didn't make the case for them using the geometric horizon, did it? So, I'm calling out AB Science and Planner Walk, who somehow these two fuckwits have managed to escalate themselves in some sort of prevalence in the anti-flat earth community. They have told us quite explicitly, I've got trimmed out quotes from them, telling us in no uncertain terms that this point marked for this maths that's currently being done by idiots like Ruhif cannot be seen, wouldn't be expected to be seen. So Nathan has called me out in something that is unrelated to me. I've not talked about dip correction at all. The only reason why I'm talking about dip correction now is because Nathan brought me into this. <laughs> so like a good friend, I'm going to call Nathan Oakley out. Because Nathan, you clearly haven't done any of the maths. You've just looked at a diagram and gone, oh, this looks like they're using the geometric horizon, so obviously they are using the geometric horizon, when if you actually do the maths for yourself, you find out that no, we are accounting for refraction, so we're only using a visual horizon. And Nathan, if you do decide to address this and insist that we're using the geometric horizon, then do the maths for yourself, because I have done the maths. And the math shows that we do not use the geometric horizon. Of course, if Nathan did decide to respond to this or something, you know, he could always cut that last bit out where I tell him to do the maths. You know, that's always an option, but that would be, you know, dishonest. And Nathan, friend, buddy, you're not dishonest, are you? I guess we'll see. They have told us quite explicitly I've got trimmed out quotes from them. Um, Nathan, if you use just trimmed out quotes from someone, then that is dishonest. Just thought you should know that. This is not capable of being seen. We've been told by AB Science, Planner Walk, Rumpus, 
and every single clown that barked refraction at us. So, given that we're told we cannot see this, how the hell... Talking to you, Rufy, you little bitch. How are you supposed to do this, Maths? Given that you cannot see and we wouldn't expect to see something you're calculating as a visual horizon seen in a sextant. Well, here is the maths here, Nathan. With 7 over 6 R refraction, exactly what you asked for. Have you got a problem with that? If so, tell me what's wrong with it. I know that I haven't commented it, but you're a smart boy. You should be able to work it out. So there'll be a lot of people that will probably be, you know, laughing or on their way to type a comment after what I just said. And in case you haven't realised, I'm using a lot of sarcasm in this video whenever I talk positively of Nathan. And I'm sure my good friend Nathan has picked up on that, haven't you? So I think this is where I should leave Nathan and his ramblings. Will Nathan address the points that I've brought up in this? Probably not. He'll probably just, you know, take one clip of something that I said and claims that it debunks everything else that I've said and not actually address the points that I've made. Although, funnily enough, now that I think about it, this is actually the closure to the argument that Nathan and I had about the Black Swan. Because he's quoting what I said about it. Him quoting me in reference to what I said about the Black Swan in a completely unrelated argument is a tacit admission that what I said about the black swan was correct. If I was wrong in my arguments about the black swan, then he shouldn't be quoting me unless he was particularly addressing something that I said about the black swan, which here he wasn't. So Nathan, you called me out, but in doing so, you tacitly acknowledged my points about a previous argument. Good job, my friend. But anyway, with that being it for this video, leave a like and subscribe if you like this video. Leave a comment letting me know what you'd like me to make videos on in the future. That's a very important thing because I'm running out of ideas. That's why I make Flat Earth videos, to be honest. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. Hugh Jars, MC Nutkin, Shaggy, Wolfie, Mori, Graymore Ghost, Kid Vicious, and Sarcha Campbell. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there, and it's always very much appreciated. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching.